my soul is tired. I'm so grateful to the seminary for that song this morning because I needed to feel that lament and hear those words. Use our tears to water thirsty ground. Give us courage to love all you create. Come to us and turn your world around. Which way is the world turning today? It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell from whichever perspective you look. Ma famille habite partout sur la terre. That's the wrong language for this morning. My family is scattered over the face of the whole earth and we speak various languages. I live here in Tulsa. My mother lives in Maine, but was born in France. And my sister has lived there in France for more than 30 years. My brother lives in Hawaii and his son lives in a wheelchair. The human family may have been scattered across the face of the earth long ago. And my family, well, I remember the night when I found out my parents' marriage was falling apart. It was an awful night. My father came to put me to bed and told me he was leaving. I got so angry. I protected my 11 year old heart with pure righteous anger. Anger can sometimes feel better than falling apart. I wonder how long the people were angry at God after God made them drop their plans. Did they carry their pure and righteous anger with them and begin to build new cities to make a new name for themselves? It's possible, even likely. It had to have been so hard to watch as their years of investment and hard work wasted away. I think of small business owners today, actors, athletes, choir directors, pastors, seminary presidents. There is a lot of babble around us, both about what to do now and about what's coming next. We definitely don't all speak the same language and we are not all experiencing the same thing. Being alive today is a lot like being on a roller coaster. It feels like we're moving too fast. It's hard to catch your breath. There are dozens of dangerous declines, nauseating turns. It's exhilarating and terrifying. And no one can tell us which direction we're actually heading in. How are we supposed to feel when we are so scattered? How did the people feel way back at the beginning when God stopped that building project? Do you think they felt like they were being punished as we are often taught or like they were being set free? In one Midrash on our story this morning, the rabbis say that as the tower grew taller and taller, it got harder and harder to lift the clay bricks to the top. It was so labor intensive and the project was lasting so long that people hardly noticed when a worker fell and died. How you, how your friends and family, how your colleagues and congregants, how your neighbors are feeling today may be tied to who they identify with in our story. Are they one of the major investors in building the tower and the city? Are they the one who had the idea? Are they the architect? Or are they the mother of the worker who falls and dies? Are they one of the workers themselves stressed, essential, and without a safety net of any sort? How about you? 
Do you feel punished or liberated these days? I know our employees at All Souls are worried about losing their jobs and that I, like many of you, wonder and worry about the future of the church. Another Midrash on the same story says that what Yahweh wanted was for us to discover and deal with our differences. That God wanted us to grow up. From this perspective, the scattering of humanity was a great gift or even many great gifts. The gift of different languages, different religions, different customs, different cultures, the gift of diversity. I wonder though how many people hung around the base of the tower after God told the people to scatter across the face of the earth. We had something good going on here. I imagine them thinking, kicking around the old broken bricks also scattered around, hoping to rebuild something that they could recognize. Maybe a few of their de descendants are still there waiting. I really appreciate both Midrashes and their messages first, when the purpose or project or profit we've been pursuing has become more important than the people impacted by that purpose or project, it's time to stop. It's time to move on and time to start over. Second, once we accept, once we really accept that we don't all speak the same language, not even in our own families, that we don't all share the same values, not even in the same church or institution. When we accept that we don't have the same priorities, not even in the same city, then we find ourselves back at the beginning in Hebrew Bereshit, in Genesis, an eternal time and place of fresh starts, of mornings breaking of new knowledge, new ways of life, new understanding. When things fall apart, when systems and symbols and marriages fall apart, we choose if we will experience the changes as judgment or punishment or liberation. My father leaving almost killed my mother. But the key word there is almost, almost, because it didn't. My mother will be 89 this August. She lived long enough, not only to reimagine her own life, but long enough to forgive my father and set herself free. Today, we're being forced to face uncomfortable truths. We're being forced to feel uncomfortable feelings. This time around, instead of being scattered, we're being forced to stop and stay put and see. It is because the pandemic and its greater impact on communities of color is visible at this time that the, at the same time, that the deadly force against black men by white police officers is visible. That police reform is possible today. And why so many more people are examining their own whiteness, many of us, for the very first time. It is because the pandemic has closed so many businesses through no fault of any individual or worker that many more people see the injustice of healthcare being tied to employment. It is because the pandemic closed our schools before summer arrived through no fault of any family or child that so many more people see the problem with basic nutrition, breakfast and lunch being provided to children through the schools. We can only fix the things we face, and sometimes we only face things when we are forced to because they are falling apart. We are living in extraordinary times. One of you may have said that. I heard Angela Davis say that 
this weekend in an interview. Angela Davis, longtime activist, scholar of social movements, persistent resistor to state violence and oppressions based on race and class. She said, she said that this moment in time is an extraordinary moment. And it's extraordinary, not just because of the younger people in the streets, although that is extraordinary. These are extraordinary times to be living in because the new openings are being created or recreated by the obstacles before us, which we can now see. The day God scattered the people across the face of the earth must have been an extraordinary day. It was the day people had to reimagine their priorities and their very purpose. It was a time such as this. What a blessing to be alive right now when things are falling apart. As we witness this unraveling, this scattering, this great turning, as some bricks and some workers and some monuments and some leaders come tumbling down, and as you tear or carry some of those down yourself. I wanna leave you with three questions that I'm asking myself and invite you to join me in asking them of yourselves. What is mine to learn in these times? What is mine to let go of in these times? And what is mine to build in these times. For after things come falling down, we will need people to do the hard work of rebuilding. Angela Davis said that too. And I think God would agree. May it be so. Amen.